our scripture is going to be from Psalm 139. And it's one that you've probably heard a lot. Uh, I think I've read this at uh, most of the memorial services I've done over the last hundred years. Um, mm -hmm. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And at the very end, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and, and lead me in the way that's everlasting. We'll pray with you. Lord Jesus, we come to you today with... Uh, with hearts full, we come today with hope, and we come with cares, um, and Lord, we thank you that you do know us. We're not a surprise to you, and help us to, uh, to realize that you made us, you know us, you call us by name, you love us, and uh, you care even about our anxious thoughts. So we give you this time, and we pray that you teach us uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we've been in this series of messages on um, fears, which uh, I was actually afraid to do, but Chris <laughs> has taken the majority of it, so that's great. Um, today I want us to look at the whole phenomenon of uh, anxiety and emotional uh, quicksand. And so to start us off, we have a, a, little, a film clip from the um, replacements with Keanu Reeves. Uh, and uh, I apologize to dance uh, for any language or uh, topics that are covered in this that uh, will offend you. That's the thing. Okay, so let's see. Hit the sound and hit the uh, video. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Can we hit the video? The press will play. You have to press the thing press in the middle that says arrow. arrow. You have to pull the blinds, too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this is just like home. <laughs> Press enter. Press enter. Okay, this button right here. Yeah, I'm trying that button. Yeah, it doesn't work, huh? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it's about to say. <laughs> you can go back and help him. It really doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, that was great. You know, let's close in prayer. <laughs> I'm just so glad that I can go away for a few weeks and nothing changes. You know, yeah. uh, things are always the same. Okay, so what happens here is uh, in this uh, sports, you turn it off, it's okay. We, we don't know. Um, uh, they're asking about for people to share their fears. And most of the people are talking about spiders and stuff. And they said, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And then Keanu Reeves says, uh, quicksand. I'm afraid of quicksand. And everybody goes, what are you talking about? And he goes, you know, uh, you go out on the field and you're playing and everything's going good. And then something goes wrong. And then something else goes wrong. And then something else goes wrong. And pretty soon you feel powerless to stop it and you can't breathe anymore and everything grinds to a stop inside you. That's quicksand. 
pretty good quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I thought about that, and I thought, he really is on to something, because it seems like in our life, we don't just have, oh, we're happy, and then we're in trouble, and then we're happy, and then we're in trouble. It's like, when things start to go, don't they really go? <laughs> You know, one thing and then another and another, and never say it can't get any worse. No. Do not ever say that. No. Why? It gets because worse. it does. Every time. You know, I made a big mistake, and that was that I agreed to write this book for the publisher on when everything goes wrong, <laughs> the adventure begins. What an idiot. <laughs> Since, since I signed those contracts in December, every single thing has gone wrong in my life. And, and I leave, you know, my wife, she goes, well, that's what you get for writing a book like that. You have to have all these bad experiences so you know what you're talking about. Like, the next one is going to be how to have a wonderful, easy life where everything's superficial and nothing happens. <laughs> that's what I want, right? <laughs> So, so I thought to myself, uh, Friday, getting ready uh, for meeting with all with you this morning, I thought, well, at least nothing else can go wrong. And then I get the call that one of the uh, people from Romeo and Juliet moving some plywood up in the attic fell through the <laughs> roof. Oh, no. wow. Fortunately, they, they caught themselves and were not impaled on the things that were down here below. Really? But I'm going... So never say nothing else can go wrong. <laughs> it, it does get worse. Richard spent a lifetime fixing the hole here where my wife fell through one day. <laughs> Maybe we should just rope off. Maybe we should rope off the end. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> oh. Now, I, you know uh, from uh, previous times that uh, I've always had kind of a thing for quicksand because growing up as a kid in Africa, it actually was a real danger there. And, uh, and so I would be really careful where I went. But when we came back to Whittier, California, a suburb of LA, I kept the anxiety. And so I'd be walking to school looking for quicksand. <laughs> what an idiot, you know. But, I, but it was fed by those Saturday morning Tarzan movies where some, they're going through the jungle and some villainous person falls into the quicksand and then pretty soon, there's a pith helmet floating on the sand, and I was like, oh, that's gonna happen to me. And it didn't happen to me for many years until I was speaking at a conference in um, Springfield, Illinois. No one's ever been there, I can tell. Uh, it's actually the capital, no big planes fly in there. So, but anyway, we went to Springfield, Illinois, and they uh, wanted me to play golf uh, before the conference started. At, a, at the Rail Country Club where the LPGA plays uh, every summer. So we go in there and they'd had a drought and we got to this one hole, so there was a big lake that had started to dry up. And you know how the bottom of the lake looks, you know, as it gets further out there? I, of course, hit my ball out towards the lake, and, but I could see it out there. And there'd been cracks on the surface, you know, and uh, they said, well, you can't go out there, it's all these ropes and think, cuidado, cuidado, you know, all around the yellow tape. And uh, I went, well, it's just out there. So I went out and everything was fine for a while. And, uh, and I got just about to the ball and as I was reaching over to get it, one foot went <laughs> And what happens when one foot goes <laughs> You immediately stick the other one in, push it up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, that's concerning. So I start moving, trying to get myself out. And every time I did, I went lower. Now I'm hip deep in this stuff. I'm, I'm sinking in the lake. And they won't come out and help me. Because it says, cuidado, stay away. They don't want to do this. And, and I'm literally, it suddenly hit me, this could end badly. And I'm, I'm, I'm sinking in this stupid dry lake in Springfield, Illinois, I never thought this is where my life would end. Uh, and uh, I finally went, you know, guys, I'm really getting afraid here because every time I moved, I went lower. And I couldn't bring myself out. And there's nothing to hold on to because if you put your hands down to hoist yourself out, then you're really there. So they finally were able to get some timbers and wood and things like that and kind of push. They wouldn't come, but they would push it out towards me until I could finally kind of roll up onto a board and then they pulled me in. Now I'm covered in 
river bum, lake muck. And, and so I kept playing, and then it dried, and so I was... <laughs> you know, I, I know, it's, it can't get any worse. And then, as we came around the clubhouse, all these people came running out from the bar, I guess, and they're all cheering as I go by, and they said, we heard that somebody almost died in the quicksand out there, and we wanted to see you. And I'm walking like Frankenstein. And they thought that was funny. But, you know, so immediately, I thought of the church. <laughs> you know, that's where my mind went, and I thought, isn't that what happens? You know, it, it seems like it's okay, and nothing's wrong, and then something goes wrong, and then it just starts getting worse until we're helpless to get out. We feel all alone because nobody's going to come and join us there, right? And so we, we find ourselves in this quicksand, like Keanu Reeves was theoretically talking about. And... and <clears throat> Have you ever had anxiety? Um, there's, there's fear, and then there's anxiety, which comes upon it. The fear, you know, I love fear because it's usually about something, right? Uh, something bad might happen, so I'm afraid. Anxiety, it may not be about anything. It's just there, and it's taking your breath away, and, and you feel like, it's taken over you, and there's nothing you can do about it, and nobody understands. Uh, Eileen, my wife, has had anxiety disorder for her whole life, and I used to get angry at her anxiety. I'm not going to let your fear control us. You know, that a loving response. <laughs> like, you know, <sighs> wasn't my best. Uh, but I'd be so frustrated because the fear would so consume and dominate everything. And when the, when the Bible says, search me, O God, and know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts, my anxiety, know my anxiety. I think it's important for us to realize that it's no secret. We may have kept it from the people around us. We may even keep it from ourselves periodically. But but God knows our, our greatest fears. The things that take our breath away and hold us back and block us from moving forward and make us want to pull away and isolate. God knows that. And it's no secret to him. Um... We've got to find a way to live uh, beyond our fears. And it's so hard to do because they're so prevalent. And Jesus talks about it all the time, and he, he tries different things. He says, fear not, you know, it's kind of commanding. And then he says, you don't have to be afraid. And then he says, um, let, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't, don't, be, don't be anxious. Um, all three ways to tell us that it's okay and we don't have to be anxious, but we still are. Have any of you who had anxiety, has, it, has anyone ever told you, oh, you don't have to be afraid? How did that help you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't have to be afraid, but, you know, it's just logical. Here's the three reasons why you don't have to be afraid. I tried that with Eileen, too. That did not work. Why? Because our feelings aren't rational. <laughs> They just are, and they consume us. And, and anxiety grows. These anxious thoughts that, that, uh, that God knows, they grow where there's three things. And um, the first one is, and I'm guilty of this one a lot lately, there's this voice inside our, our hearts and heads that tell us, uh, you can't do it. You're not going to get through this. Um, you don't have what it takes. Uh, you can't stop this from happening. Uh, who do you think you are? You know, and, uh, and there's this inner voice. Now, I, I used to try and figure out who was saying that to me in my life, and I realized it doesn't matter because they're probably dead by now, and I just play their tapes, you know, in my head, but, but there's something going on inside of us that tells us, you cannot do this, and, and 
when we listen to that voice, it becomes a very, very uh, scary thing for us because it sounds like it's the truth. I mean, I've spent this last month going, what, who do you think you are to write this book? Why, why do you know? You don't know anything. This make, doesn't make sense. This is just the West Falls Shuffle. This is just the story. Da, da, da. These are meaningless. Da, da, da. And, and I'm, do, I'm doing this to myself. And then I get peaceful about it. No, I get more and more anxious. What do I know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, John, you are always right. Yeah, I told you where you stink. You're terrible. This, you know, and and this criticism goes on and on. And um, and then something else happens, and that is um, I start listening to the fear. And um, I start paying attention to the fear. And I start letting the fear fill my mind and fill my attention. And pretty soon, uh, my fear is dominating me. But because I'm kind of a cool guy and I got it together and everything like that, I don't actually share that with anyone. <clears throat> that's, that's my secret, you know. Don't tell anybody that I just said it. <laughs> but you know, it, it, I don't want anybody to know, but it's so in my mind that I keep it there and I harbor it there and it just grows and grows and grows. And I can't get beyond it. And then you know what I want to do? I want to withdraw. I want to pull away, which I've done to a certain extent, you know. But I mean really pull away, not just not show up, but I mean pull inward and push people away. And because really, when you're afraid, you don't want people coming around you because they might try and fix you. And they can't do that, can they? What are we going to do? Well, God knows our anxious thoughts. If God is completely aware of what's going on inside of you, what's going on inside of me, and he cares about us, and he comes towards us with, with mercy, with compassion, with love, right? Wouldn't he give us the means to live beyond that? Wouldn't he give us the, the resources to, to actually break through our fear and our anxiety? I think so. Um, there's a, a, I know I'm sounding like a top psychologist right now, but um, <laughs> that shows where my head's been lately. But um, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, research being done at the University of Texas in Austin uh, by some clinical psychologists there. And they're looking at this area of fear and anxiety. And, and you know what they found is the thing that, that they found something that takes it away. You know what it is? This is a sec totally secular. It's not Christian. It's not Bible. It's not anything like that. This is totally secular. So the clinical psychologists at the university have discovered self-compassion, they're calling it. Now, the word that's used the most in the Old Testament referring to God and how he treats us is compassion, mercy. The Hebrew word chesed. Right? I've had you pronounce that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Chesed. Like you're clearing your throat. And uh, it's, it's, it's the, God's tender mercies towards us. His, his tuning in and caring and, and having you uh, be the focus of his love and kindness. It's mercy. Right? They said that is the antidote for anxiety right now. So what would happen if we practiced uh, this, this treating ourselves the way God treats us with mercy? What would happen different in our life? What would we do if we were self-compassionate? What would we do if we were uh, treating ourselves the way God treats us? If we would see ourselves in our situation the way God sees us in our situation, 
What would we do differently? That's an important question, right? Because we can't just go, oh yeah, we need to be more self-compassionate, let's go get a bagel and, uh, you know, run away. Now, what can we do differently? Well, if we were merciful to ourselves, we would practice tangibly uh, something that's uh, been around the church for a long time, uh, they're not new to us, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. That's what we practice with ourselves. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And, and if we were loving, accepting, and forgiving ourselves, it would be like, um, if you love somebody, what do you do? Well, first of all, you notice that they're there. You know, one of the um, one of the missing ingredients in a lot of marriages, a lot of relationships, is that, that after a while we don't really see the other person there. Uh, we see evidence that they've been there, but we don't really see them anymore. And when they share something, we don't really hear their heart anymore. And we don't understand where that's coming from. And we don't want to ask because we might be told and uh, we don't want to know that. So it's better that we just stay superficial with those we love. Well, guess what? That's what we do with ourselves. We don't ask questions. We don't say what's going on and, and why and, and how can we help you feel lovable? Um, most of the time, and it's kind of, you know, it's obviously personal. I'm just sharing. I'm not talking about you guys. You're just eavesdropping on my little uh, conversation with the Lord. Um, most of the time, we're surprised to find out we're lovable. Which is weird, really, because when you think about it, there's all kinds of reasons to prove that you're lovable, right? Uh, you can look back over your life and you see things that you've done and, and how you've been and, and um, what's gone on inside of you and, and around you. And you think, you know, I'm really lovable if you were somebody else, but for yourself, you don't see that. Tune out on it. And so when you, when you hear that you're lovable, it kind of surprises us. But that's exactly what we need to be hearing. If God knows our anxious thoughts and doesn't pull away, he doesn't throw up his hands and go, oh my golly, I didn't realize you were anxious. I'm out of here, you know. As far as I know, God doesn't do that. I might do that with you, you know, but God doesn't do that. He knows our anxious thoughts. And what's it say? You know my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word's on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in. You have your hand upon me. Your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Even knowing our anxious thoughts, God still is involved and holding and present and with us. Loving, accepting, and forgiving. Well, if God does that with us, why can't we do that? Why is that so hard for us? Um, I know it's really easy for me to forgive y'all I'm not saying you need it, you know, but if you did, I'd, I'd forgive you in a second. And without a thought, of course. No worries. Why is, is it more difficult to forgive myself? Why do I keep going back and re, redoing things? Hmm. 
If we were to really practice love, acceptance, and forgiveness, I think it would radically change us. It would change us on the inside, and then it would start to change the way we, we are with other people. It would sure change the little harbor church, wouldn't it? If this was the place where people talk about, oh, oh yeah, that place, you know, nothing but love, acceptance, and forgiveness there. Oh, no kidding. Well, I'm not going there then. <laughs> you know, uh, wouldn't that be a weird thing to have people gossip about our church? <laughs> but what would it do with our pagan friends? What would it do where we work and go to school and, and shop and hang out with our extended family, pagan families? What, what would that do? You mean we have to love, accept, and forgive them? I thought we only do that with the Christians. No. If we really did this, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Um, I think it could be transforming. You know what I want for you? I want for you to, to come to really experience that God knows you without any barriers. You don't have to hide. No secrets. I think it was Paul Turnier, the Swiss physician, um, who wrote... Um, Nothing makes us so lonely as our secrets. And yet, we'd rather keep our secrets and not lose the loneliness. But what would happen if we actually came to grips with God's incredible involvement and intimate knowledge of each one of us? Nowhere to hide, no reason to hide. Boy, wouldn't our prayers be different? I th at first I thought, well, I won't have to pray because God knows me. He knows every word on my mouth. Why would I have to pray anymore? Huh, Larry, we don't have to do prayer time anymore because God knows it. Or you go, yeah, but because he loves us so much, maybe he wants us to share. Maybe he wants us to care. Maybe he wants us to bring it out. And so, uh, if, if you knew that God actually knew you and loved you anyway, what would he want to have happen in you? And that brings us to our homework assignment. This week, and I've had you do this before, and some of you didn't score well on this, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying the guilt, you know, I'm just uh, saying you didn't score well. But I want you to take a piece of paper this week. And I want you to write on it. Since God knows me so well and loves me so much, What would he have happen in me this week? And what would he have happen through me? Why don't you write that down? And if you write it down, and then the next day you think of something else, write that down too underneath it. And then if the next day you think of something else, go ahead and write that down too. But what would he, I think that the one by one step by one step, love, acceptance, forgiveness, love, acceptance, and forgiveness, love, acceptance, and forgiveness, the transformation becomes real in our life. And then we don't need the fear. We don't need the critical voice in our head. We don't need to pull away. We don't need to be controlled by it anymore. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need you and we, we're we boggled, I admit it, by your caring knowledge of us and that your attitude towards us is merciful, far more merciful than we are. But Lord, we pray that, uh, that as you work in us this week, that you would give us the courage to begin to treat ourselves with love and acceptance and forgiveness. Free us from the grip of our fears and give us the courage to live in you, fully alive. That's our prayer, that's our need. In Jesus' name, amen.